So this is my response to the topic cat on a hot tin roof. Manhattan, 1996, July, standing at the corner of 16th Street and 6th Avenue. Bill Clinton is president and it was a different time. My spike heels sink into the soft gooey asphalt that has melted into a type of black putty and a pathetic response to the sweltering heat. I wonder if I will be able to extract my stilettos from the pavement when the light changes. It is a busy Wednesday afternoon in Manhattan, the Flatiron District. Thousands of people, natives, tourists, transplants, people busy in their lives with places to be, people to see, lives to live, but there is no sound. Thousands of people gathered at the congested intersection waiting for the light to change, but no sound. Thousands of people, and they're all quiet. Everyone is quiet. They've been silenced, silenced by the sun. The heat sucks it out of you. It swallows your voice. It stifles the sounds in your head. It simplifies things. It simplifies the infinite thoughts that typically scatter through your mind and conforms them into one. One thought, which is really a need. The thoughts dissolve into one blind need. A desire, one collective desire, a desire for relief. A desire for cool, just cool. The need for cool. We're hot. That's the problem. We're all hot. It's July. July in Manhattan and everyone is hot and sticky. We're all sticky. We drip and then stick. Tears of sweat dribble down cheeks, arms, legs, stomachs, backs. Those wearing clothes show the heat through the wet spots on their garments. Those stripped down to lesser coverage glisten with the wet. Everyone is uncomfortable. But there's an underlying sense that the discomfort somehow unites us. We at the corner form a collective consciousness of sorts and we comfort each other. We're all in this together. Egos get quiet. We all look like shit with our damp hair and sweat stains and runny makeup. There is no finer leveler of the vein than a sweltering humid afternoon on the streets of Manhattan. It connects us. We battle the heat together. We wear its marks and we wear it with pride as we wait on the corner in the heat, in the silence with the sun beating down, shutting us all up. As I fantasize about the AC unit that awaits me at my destination, I tug on the black ni polyester nylon blend that has cemented itself to my stomach. My dress is snug and it's hard to create space between my skin and the thin black synthetic fabric, but I try. Maybe I can let some air sneak into the limited space that I freed up. Maybe my dress will dry if I hold it out so that it's not touching my wet skin. Truth be told, my dress is not really a dress. It's a slip from the 60s. My mom had sent it to me. She had worn it to dinner parties she attended with my father when they were young and he worked as a resident at the hospital. But when she wore it, it was a secret. A secret undergarment worn underneath her otherwise perhaps see-through dress, possibly to prevent any light from showing the shadow between her legs if she passed in front of a lamp. And that same secret would serve as a step, a pause, a pause between outer garment and bra and panties when she returned home to undress. But that was the 60s. These were the 90s and Bill Clinton was president and slips were in and there was no 9-11. And we were innocent and frequented the strips of Manhattan with reckless abandon. We wore the slips on the street like sundresses. We shimmied down the block in our slips with our mules on our feet and soaked up the light and the heat and enjoyed feeling sexy and loud. <laughs> My slip was black, polyester with lace overlay on the bodice and hem, a shiny synthetic extravaganza. It was perfectly complemented by black patent leather heels accented by my cherry red pedicure. It was something to be young, hot, and sexy in the urban heat in a black slip and heels. Life was full. There was, were no iPhones, no cell phones. Life was full, and we were in it together. We were all there with each other, conscious of each other, connected by our shared experience, connected by our discomfort, connected by our need. The light changed and there was movement. I carefully lifted my foot to see if my pump would come with me. I eased the skinny spike from the moist cement and stepped forward. Success! I pulled my other foot out and began making my way. I had just a few blocks to go, but I was walking east, avenue to avenue, which took longer than the streets. I had 12 plus minutes to go in the heat and there was no question. I would look like I stepped out of a shower when I arrived. I was headed to my master class. It was the final class of the term. I would do my final scene today, Williams, Maggie. I was Maggie the cat. 
shoulder to shoulder with the masses. I picked my way across 6th Avenue in the heat. I pushed my sunglasses back up to their proper position. They kept sliding down my nose. I blotted my face with the washcloth I kept in my purse on hot days when I had it together enough to remember to take, to take it with me. The smell of grilling sausages and peppers from the trio of push carts lined along 16th Street struck me as I passed. I was greeted with smiles from the men working the grills. We were New Yorkers and we shared a camaraderie. We could spot tourists from a mile. And when our eyes met with recognition, we gave each other that knowing glance, that look that says, hmm, look at them. <laughs> look at the silly tourists. Never mind that we too were transplants. We too had come from faraway places. No, we were New Yorkers now. We felt superior in our knowledge that we belonged here and there was no other better place to be. I slowly make my way up the poorly lit steps of the narrow stairwell that leads to the studio. The smell of the Korean bar that dominates the deli occupying the first floor assaults me in the stuffy quiet. Everything feels crammed. The ceiling is low, the stairs are tiny, it is dim, and the stench of the food seems to stick to me. My feet are not particularly big, and yet there is barely room on each step for me to place my high-heeled shoe on the putty gray vinyl floor tiles that are trimmed at the edge with a chrome-grooved border. I'm careful. If I trip, I go tumbling down to the Korean deli. I know the studio has AC. Just a few more steps and I will reach relief. I push the glass door at the top of the steps and land in the ante room outside the studio. The temperature drops 20 degrees. My body reacts. I'm covered in goosebumps and the perspiration on my skin chills me. It will take a few moments to adjust. I'm acutely conscious of my damp hair and face and I steal a vein glass in the full length mirror that covers one wall. Though essentially soaked, my hair is pulled back in a clip and somehow it's okay. <laughs> We're actors. We come to the studio to train and our bodies are what we work with. And we work with each other and our bodies and our life force, they, they create a kind of forgiveness of some kind. We are lusty, vibrant folk who feed off each other. And while hopelessly drawn to a world that demands we obsess over what we look like, we are strangely unmasked in the classroom, naked with our sweat and our flaws. The previous class has just ended and a modest hustle ensues as people exit and others enter in the room to claim their spots. Anxious, I survey the room. Where is he? There's a man in my class. He'll be famous one day, one day soon. We didn't know it yet, but we should have. Six feet of nothing but testosterone. Six feet of nothing but cool. Six feet of indifference, which made you want him all the more. Six feet of a lot of things, but not of need. He did not breed need. Even in the heat of today, I'm sure he didn't break a sweat. I stepped into the classroom and there, perched in his typical spot, last row, all the way against the wall, next to no one, he sat. He always sat alone. He was brick. He was all brick. He was a Williams masterpiece. He embodied every sexy, steamy, seductive man that ever slithered through a Williams scene. Woman or man, he was a god who would make you throw yourself at him. And he was the man for me. Sitting in class, knowing he was up there in that corner, my heart beat just a little faster. My cheeks flushed just a little rosier. And when I had to get up to do my scene or use the ladies' room, my walk just got that much sexier. <laughs> it was unconscious and deliberate at the same time. A man, a man who raises the stakes, a man who makes it all mean something, a man I could love. My scene is called and my partner and I take the floor. Before long I hear myself, I hear my Maggie. And while I say my lines to my scene partner, I know who I'm talking to. I'm talking to my brick in the corner. You were a wonderful lover. Such a wonderful person to go to bed with. And I think mostly because you were really indifferent to it. Isn't that right? Never had any anxiety about it. Did it naturally, easily, slowly, with absolute confidence and perfect calm. More like opening a door for a lady or seating her at a table than giving expression to any longing for her. Your indifference made you wonderful at lovemaking. Strange, but true. You know, if I thought you would never, never, never make love to me again, I would go downstairs to the kitchen and pick out the longest and sharpest knife I could find and stick it straight into my heart. I swear that I would. But one thing I don't have is the charm of the defeated. My hat is still in the ring and I am determined to win. 
What is the victory of a cat on a hot tin roof? I wish I knew. Just staying on it, I guess, as long as she can. And I stop. I'm on that roof, just like her, just like Maggie. I wonder how long I can stay on it. I marvel at the symbiotic nature of love and indifference. I marvel at William's genius as I lust after the man in the corner, my brick who doesn't know I exist. I'm hot, I'm sexy, I'm in my prime. I live in New York and men follow me down the street, but not my brick. He doesn't follow me anywhere. He sits in the corner waiting to be a star and I am invisible. What is that hopeless attraction to indifference? Why am I cut that way? How long do I have? How long do I stay on? 